A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. Good afternoon, or good morning. I don't even know what time it is. Good morning. So morning, you have seven minutes before I tell you it's the afternoon. Well, I you, honey. Charlie Adelson speaks with his mom, Donna, several times a week. Good, I just got done with a little Nova... And you know it's so good? Sunny side up eggs with some sliced Nova. They chat about his nephews. But you know what, Grandma? I think I'll have some locks. I really like locks. And his siblings, Wendy and Rob. Wendy's like seven years behind Robert. So Robert was leaving for college when Wendy was 10 years old. So she was 12 years old when he was going off to college. So, I mean, he had little to no, like, any real interaction with her before he left the house. I can tell you how Wendy was when he left for college. Cried her eyes out for days. For days? Really? Oh, yeah. Horrible. She was a mess when he left for college. Charlie is happy his dad's still working at his age, even if he is slowing down. If dad does two days a week, it's real. It's going to be something that he feels like he's retired. Of course, these calls, placed in the weeks before the first arrests are made in the Dan Markell murder investigation, are being secretly recorded. In early April of 2016, law enforcement began a wiretap on Charlie's cell phone. And anyone listening on April 28th... Hello? Hola, diga. Hello? ...would have heard Charlie make a very different kind of call. Who is this? Who's this? Uh, Someone's been calling my family. I'm trying to figure out who this is. The man on the other end of the phone says his name is Sammy. And he wants something from Charlie. All right, what's what's going on? Well, what's going on is my brother Tato. Okay, my brother Tato has not been taken care of. His family's not been taken care of. I talked to a dentist. Why, why are you calling me? Who, who, who are you? I gave the number to a lady. I don't know Tato. You don't know Tato? I'm no. sure you know Katie and Tuto. Mm-hmm. They've been taken care of since the family problem been taken care of up north. Tato is the nickname for Luis Rivera, and Tuto is Sigfredo Garcia. Sammy heavily implies Charlie knows them both. Uh, I don't, I've never met, met these people, but let me call you back, okay? But Sammy's insistent. That's bullshit, man. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know this lady. I don't know your relationship with this lady, but we know what the fuck is going on. Uh, this ain't going that. away. Take care, take care of Tato just like you take care of Katie and Tuto, man. Let me call you back. Charlie plays it pretty cool on the phone. But later, he makes a few calls. One to his mother, and the other to Katie. From Wondery, I'm Matthew Scher, and this is Over My Dead Body. Baby, I'm guilty I've got his blood on my hand Baby, you're crazy I never touched that man The first season is called Tally, and this is episode five, The Maestro. At the time the cops are listening in on Charlie's calls, he's 39 years old, three years younger than his brother Rob. He's now a fairly big guy, muscular guy, works out a lot. But in, in when he was younger, he was not that big. No, no, I, I think you know, growing up on the, on the small side uh, of things it made him motivated to want to be uh, physically larger. And I think since his late teenage years, he's become heavily involved in you know, weightlifting, and that's important to him. For Rob, his childhood in Florida was a happy one. The family was well off, and they were all pretty close. They liked to poke fun at one another. They were at a tennis tournament or something. That's Haritha, Rob's wife. And he bought like uh, some kind of snack or something, and they gave him too much money back in change. So Rob said, oh, you, got you made a mistake, and he gave the money back. And all day, the whole family proceeded to berate him, but why would you do that? Why would you give that money back? This kind of thing got Rob a nickname from the rest of his family. They'd call him 
Honest Abe. My parents used to make fun of it as me, as Honest Abe. And I don't have any better or higher reason for that other than you just have to do the right thing. But, Rob says, doing the right thing wasn't Charlie's M.O. I don't think that Charlie necessarily has that same feeling. I think there's more of an ends justify the means. In fact, between his two siblings, Rob says he always felt closer to Wendy. As he and Charlie got older, the differences between the brothers only seemed to increase. We, we didn't have a lot in common. We didn't really spend any extra time together as, as adults. We would, you know, call each other on their birthday, and then as technology evolved, they would text each other. By 2016, Rob is living in a nice colonial-style house in Albany, New York. A middle-aged family man with Haritha and two kids. Charlie, on the other hand, hasn't settled down and hasn't left South Florida. He likes going out in Miami with a tight-knit group of buddies and has a series of girlfriends. He's also successful in his own right. He's a respected periodontist, extractions, implants, bone therapy, and he makes a good living at it. A really good living. He owns multiple properties in Miami and drives a Ferrari. His nickname is The Maestro. He had a, a he license. Gave himself. Yeah, he gave himself the nickname The Maestro. His friends refer to him as the maestro. He has a license plate that says maestro. I think it says a lot when you unironically name yourself the maestro. Yeah, he's got a vanity license plate that says maestro. He's also got a concealed carry permit. He keeps a gun under the seat of his car. Charlie works out religiously. His girlfriends post photos of him shirtless on Instagram. And he knows a lot about different steroid and weight regimens which kinds you cycle, and which you can stay on for years. When friends call the maestro on the phone, he dispenses advice about steroids and guns and teeth. Yeah, he, his tooth may be coming in, is what's causing the pain. And his sister's love life. She's not 25, Wendy. She's, no. No. Yeah. No, she's not. She's 37 with two kids. If you want to set me up as a Victoria's Secret model that's 37 with two kids, I, you already know what I'd tell you. I don't know. I've heard that story before. Thank you, but no thank you. Yeah. And finances. It's not going to be more than 15000 to get it off the ground. Yeah, I'm not. And then we're at 6000 a month, and that's it. Charlie's ready to dispense advice on a whole host of subjects. Rob says the family joke was, Charlie's never wrong because Charlie's always right. Like, he will talk to you until the point you would just agree with him to make the conversation end. But the, the phrase, Charlie's never wrong because Charlie's always right, was kind of a family mantra. And on April 19th, his mom calls to ask him about something very unusual that just happened to her. I got some, I got some paperwork hand-delivered to me. You're being sued? No, she's not being sued. This is something else. Donna has just been stopped in the street by a man named Sammy. I can't, uh, IRS. Register. You know, um, those IRS people, they kind of bother you sometimes, but, you know, unfortunately not now. Sammy asked Donna for money, $5,000. She tells Charlie that they need to meet and talk. Uh, does it involve me or other people? Well, probably both of us. What's that? Probably the two of us. So you probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. Sammy told Donna that she owed his family for something they did for her family. And he handed her a piece of paper, telling her it would explain what he's talking about. When she looks at it, she sees it's a press release about Dan Markell's murder. Donna and Charlie meet about it. Then, Charlie makes a plan to go see his ex-girlfriend, Katie Magbanawa. 180 seconds on the floor. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, bye. Text me a full address. They meet in Sunny Isles Beach, in a strip mall near a real estate office where Katie's been working. Oh. I'm outside and I'll park in front of the juice bar. In the key spot? Juice, juice bar. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll walk out right now. All right, come on, stop. Okay. The two of them get a table at a pizza place called Dolce Vita. They sit down across from each other. Charlie's wearing a white T-shirt and khaki shorts. Later, Assistant State's Attorney Georgia Kappelman will ask Detective Craig Isom to walk her through this meeting. And was this conversation surveilled? It was. All right. Was there video 
uh, footage taken of this conversation? Because law enforcement is monitoring more than just Charlie's phone calls. They have people on the ground, too. And understandably, they're extremely interested in what Charlie and Katie are here to talk about. There's video. It's, it's not the greatest. Uh, okay. But there's also audio. Tell us about the audio. Well, the audio isn't great either. Isom says you can make out snippets of their conversation. The audio was primarily Charlie giving her a background on what was going on with this delivery of this note to his mother. He reads some of what was said into the record. It sounds like Charlie is telling Katie how to pay the guy off. Then he gives specific instructions. Quote, I give you money, you call him on the phone. All I want you to say is I got a call from somebody who said you reached out, unquote. He then tells her again, quote, I got a call from some friends that said you reached out to them and that you mentioned my name. Charlie instructs her to deny knowing anything, but that she'll pay him as charity. The next one says, Charlie telling her, quote, if it's the police, they can't take the money and won't even come meet you. They fucked up. If it's this guy, maybe that fades out, comes back in, what he knows, fades out, comes back in. You better kill him because he's going to be a big problem. If you can't do it, I'll have someone else do it, Charlie says. Hey, honey, how are you? Good, what's going on? I'm sitting and watching the boys at their tennis clinic. They're having a wonderful time. A couple minutes after he gets up from the table at Dolce Vita with Katie, Charlie gets on the phone to Donna. How's the day going? Uh, it's good, it's good. I'm just leaving and uh, I just spent some coffee with a friend. Uh-huh. And, um... Uh, Everything's good. I'm actually going to, uh, everything's good. Yeah, everything's uh, fine. Charlie tells Donna he's been giving this friend relationship advice. I gave her some good advice. Yeah. And, uh, and she's just sleeping on it. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. relationships are not easy. No, they're not. They're not. Uh, so, so that's it. So everything's, everything's fine anyway. It's no. w- without a doubt. It's fine. Great. Yeah, yeah. No no question in the world. I would not. Uh, but it doesn't seem like everything's fine. Sammy just won't go away. In the days after Charlie and Katie meet, she tries to follow his instructions. She turns to Sigfredo for help contacting the phone number Charlie had given her, but it goes nowhere. Katie and Sigfredo are in the middle of a fight, and it's not clear if he ever even tries to call. Meanwhile, Sammy keeps bugging the Adelsons. On April 25th, Donna and Harvey receive a letter, this time at their home. You tell me that this is being taken care of. Um, I'm, it's, um, it's being taken care of the best that yeah. I know it's being taken care of, but I know you get yourself all worked up and all fucking crazy, and it's, it's, that has to stop. I mean, I really don't want to, you know. Okay. Well, I did have to talk to you, didn't I? If people don't write letters, people don't show their faces, people don't give you cell phone numbers. Like, it's not done like that. It's, it's somebody just messing around. Yeah. Fishing. I got you. Charlie seems to know how a shakedown for money should go down. If somebody was going to do something, nobody would show their face. Nobody would give you a cell phone number. Nobody would write something and put it in the mail. There's, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Each one of those is a huge mistake into itself. You know, when somebody does something, you'll get a, someone gives you a visit, you won't be able to identify their face, and you'll be given 48 hours. Yeah, that's a visit. So let me get back to work because I'm busy okay. here. And you got to just stop with the nonsense, okay? A few days later, a man calls the Adelson Institute. What happened? Um, somebody called my dad's office. Mm-hmm. They were looking for him. Saying okay. that they dropped off some paperwork to them. Charlie and Katie sound like they're getting more and more frustrated. Look, Katie, 
think it through. Find out who the fuck it is. That's all I'm asking you. By now, Charlie's called Sammy himself, and the conversation made him suspicious. Like he tells his mom, he's pretty sure it's someone just fishing for information or for money. But he's annoyed Katie isn't following his directions. I'm pissed the fuck off. Like, I'm gonna fucking go to the cops right now. Okay, well, either you go to the cops or we go to the cops or exactly. find out. We'll find We're out. We're gonna the fucking floor. go to the cops because this is fucking bullshit. They don't go to the cops. They never go to the cops. Which, when you think about it, is kind of weird. The cops, well, of course, the cops already know all about this. We applied for authorization to conduct a wire intercept of Catherine Magbonwa's phone and Charlie Adelson's cell phone. They know all about Sammy asking Donna Adelson for money. Yes, of course, she's going to be wearing green, black, and white top. They got the whole thing on tape. Walking southbound on Alton on the west side, approaching the crosswalk. And they're watching from a van across the street. They're watching when Sammy walks up to Donna with the press release about Dan Markell's murder in his hand. He's a pretty big guy, bald and bearded, in a gray t-shirt and jeans. When he reaches out with the paper, Donna looks startled. She clutches her chest and takes a few steps backwards. But Sammy isn't what he seems. Do you see Tom now? Ultimately, we sparked activity by having an undercover FBI agent contact Donna Adelson outside of her home on South Beach. The whole thing is what law enforcement calls a bump. Basically an attempt to provoke suspects into giving themselves away. Uh, she has the paper, they're walking away. You see walking down southbound, she's walking southbound to the crosswalk. Immediately after the contact with, with this uh, Agent Donna Adelson went back to uh, what sounded like her home. Investigator Isom later explains that once the undercover officer handed Donna the paper and asked for the money, law enforcement was waiting for the family to react, which of course, the family did. She was monitored talking to Charlie Adelson. The monitor was on Charlie Adelson's cell phone. They asked you for $5,000. Mm-hmm. That's fucking crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... I mentioned, um, you know, an ex-girlfriend. Let me take a look at it. Mm-hmm. And then, I'll, and then I'll go from there. That's when Charlie called Katie. Something regarding her son. Something regarding his ex-girlfriend. And the person asking my mom for some money. What? Yeah. This wasn't the only evidence the police gathered. They had hundreds of phone calls between Charlie and Donna, Charlie and Katie, Katie and Sigfredo. Charlie's calls in particular are peppered with weird references. Bonsai trees, pot-bellied pigs, relationship advice. It sometimes sounds like he's talking in code, which, according to police, he is. Oh my God, I didn't even tell you. One of my friends has the cutest hot belly pig. Has the cutest what? Hot belly pig. Hot belly pig? Yeah, you know what a pig is? Are you serious? That's not good. I know. I'm, I, fucking get, I, I like dogs, not pigs. In fact, in one call, Katie gets so frustrated, she comes right out and says it. I don't give a shit about all this fucking code shit. By the time the arrests are made, Charlie and Katie are both very clear they know someone's listening. I'll call you from a landline. Text me on WhatsApp. Anything that you would not want the FBI to be listening to, don't say it on this phone. Oh, and there's something else suspicious about the connection between Katie and Charlie. There was an obvious spike in income in August of 2014. At a court hearing, investigator Isom will zero in on Katie's finances over the past few years. In the months after the murder, Katie starts getting a regular paycheck every two weeks from the Adelson Institute, signed by Donna. She was steadily paid $407.58 every two weeks. But for doing what? There was almost no paperwork for Katie. No work schedule, no application, no record of a job title among the files investigators subpoenaed from the Adelson Institute. 
and in their eight months of surveillance on Katie, Isom says he can't find a single time when her movements have her actually going to the office. But it's more than that. In the 12 months before the murder, Katie only deposited about $15,000 total into her bank account. In the 12 months after the killing, she's made $44,000 worth of deposits, mostly in small cash increments at ATMs. She gets a new car on the cheap. A 2001 Lexus LS430 sedan. It was owned by Harvey Adelson as the registered owner of the car through the state of Florida records. And there's even talk of her getting the Adelson's boat. If you want, if it would make you feel more comfortable, I could just do the boat title this year and transfer the title to your name. I trust you. Like, if it's, if it's, I know you're saying about the concerns, if you want, I can fucking put it in your name. I don't care. Oh, it could be under my name and then you're borrowing it for me? It's registered to my dad, Charlie says, but so what? And finally, there was something about Katie that had changed during this time when you looked at her Facebook photos. The images on the slides compared before and after showed obvious breast enhancement that first appeared on March 6, 2015. Prosecutors discovered that Katie had had breast enhancements performed by the plastic surgeon, Dr. Leonard Rudner, or as he's known around Miami, Dr. Boobner. And were you able to determine how the augmentation was paid for? Uh, it was paid for primarily in cash, $4,400 in two payments, one for $4,000, one for $400. Katie paid for half. The other half? A friend said it was paid for by Charlie. The cash, the gifts, the boob job. Prosecutors claimed it's all payment to Katie for organizing the murder of Dan Markell. My secrets are basically out at this point. Georgia Kappelman is the prosecutor from the state attorney's office in Leon County. She has three banker's boxes sitting next to her desk, stuffed full of documents from the Markell case. She's been on it since the start, and she's not shy about giving her theory of what happened. I think, you know, there was just a lot of animosity between the Adelsons, Wendy, and the in-laws and Dan Markell in general, more so than what you typically even see in a divorce situation. The undercover operation was an attempt to confirm a working theory that had crystallized for pretty much everyone in law enforcement working the case. This is theory, you asked for my theory, that Donna was really the one driving the ship as far as driving everyone insane about getting this done. I think Charlie, you know, made the decision about how it would get handled. And he knew Katie had some connections with some folks that could probably accomplish this. Um, And I think through his relationship with Katie, she was the one that enlisted Garcia, who ultimately enlisted Rivera, to come and do the murder. The cops' undercover operation certainly worked in one respect. It sent the family into a frenzy. I think the circumstantial evidence is very compelling, and pretty much everyone that's reviewed that agrees. Charlie did call Sammy that one time. He tells the undercover officer that he's gonna call back, but as far as we can tell, he never does. In the weeks that follow, Charlie drops some heavy hints to friends and family that he knows law enforcement could be listening in to his calls. But if they were hoping Charlie would confess to a murder on those calls, they were out of luck. I have to have enough evidence to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. And if, and I only get one shot. Still, the cops decide the evidence they've gathered is enough to go after not just Tato, Tuto, and Katie, but also Charlie Adelson. But it's not up to the cops. The state prosecutors will make the final decision. In June of 2016, they only agree to move forward on the arrests of Tato and Tuto, Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia. Over the summer, 
no more arrests come. A lot of the initial tension was in, well, yeah, we can, these are just theories at this point, but I have to prove that in court. That's what the state attorney kept saying. I have to prove all of this in court. That's part of what leads the police to release some of the most damning details of the case to reporters like Carl Letters. Speculation swirls, but still, no more arrests. The Adelson family pushes back against the speculation through their lawyers, who release a joint statement to the press. We understand why the government has put the Adelson family through this type of severe scrutiny, but nothing is turned up that supports this fanciful fiction that the Adelsons were involved. The investigation has gone so deep that it employed FBI agents, undercover agents, and a tip line. There is reason that the police have not arrested any of the Adelsons. They weren't involved in Dan's death. So Georgia Kaplan's case is stuck. Yeah, because there's no one to say that Charlie hired me to come kill Dan Markell, because no one's talking other than Rivera, and Rivera was insulated from Charlie and or any other unindicted co-conspirators that are involved in this. Then in late September of 2016, Georgia Kappelman and her team have a breakthrough. They come to an agreement with Luis Rivera. In exchange for Rivera's confession and cooperation, he'll get only seven years tacked onto the 12 year sentence he's already serving. And why was that deal offered? Uh, because I wanted to be able to move forward against Ms. Magbanawa, and I didn't think I could do it without his testimony. Which helps them make another arrest, Katie. This morning, Catherine Magbanua is facing a first-degree murder charge for the slaying of Professor Dan Markell. One that may finally tie Charlie Adelson to the murder. Police say the 31-year-old Magbanua is the link between the alleged triggerman and Wendy Adelson's family. Yindra Velasquez is Katie's best friend. She got arrested two days before my birthday. So that's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> Katie's godmother to her daughter. I'm sad, obviously. I'm really sad. Uh, I wish she was here and she was spending time with her goddaughter and, you know, spending time with me and doing everything we used to do. But unfortunately, it can't happen. Yinder says she's tried to shield her daughter from the story. But one day, her daughter walked into the living room and saw Katie's mugshot on a news special. And she's like, oh, you know, like my, like, you know, she calls me like Theo and Tia, like my uncle and aunt. Um, you know, she's like, you know, they, they wouldn't do anything like that. They, 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 they wouldn't do anything like that. Like, that's just all she kept seeing. Yindra says Katie never mentioned anything about Dan's murder to her. And if her friend did have something to do with it. I would definitely want to know why. I mean, she had no reason to do anything like that. Like, she honestly did not. She comes from a really good family. Um, her mother was a great, great person. Like, that woman was amazing. As for Charlie, Yindra says she only met him a couple times when Charlie and Katie were dating. They went to the club. Um, they would hang out on Fort Lauderdale. Um, but I didn't really know him in depth, so I can't really say much. With Rivera's confession and Katie Magbanawa's arrest, Prosecutor Georgia Kappelman says she hoped she would get what she needed to indict more co-conspirators. And she had another piece of evidence, what the arrest affidavit for Katie describes as a flurry of communication between the alleged co-conspirators just two and a half weeks before Dan was murdered. In what appears to be a night of frantic phone tag, Katie calls Sigfredo over 50 times. She also talks to Charlie several times in between. And both Katie and Sigfredo try to call Harvey Adelson's phone. Why? What were they all discussing that night? Why would Sigfredo Garcia be calling Harvey Adelson's phone? If it takes waiting to make sure that I have all of that evidence in my arsenal, then I don't mind waiting. Um, so that's kind of the game we're playing right now. Hard to think of a case with stronger circumstantial evidence than this one. If you were going just on circumstantial evidence, I mean, there would have to be, this was so baffling, it would have to be the biggest coincidence in the world that these people drove to Tallahassee mm -hmm. and shot Dan in his driveway. Well, defense attorneys can be pretty creative coming up with other ways to explain pieces of evidence. Have they tried to do that yet? No, they'll be doing that in court. I would say that 
some of my prior dentists clearly <laughs> had, uh, had experience in butchering people. Richard, he didn't want us to use his last name, has been getting his dental work done at the Adelson Institute for years. To be a little bit cliche, don't you know, you always felt at home with them. Harvey Adelson did some work to fix a chipped tooth Richard got in a bike riding accident. Then he started going to Charlie, too. But he did a particularly excellent job, so I really had no qualms about getting the work done by his son. Richard's pushing 50, but he still has his wisdom teeth, and they were causing him some pain. So he scheduled an appointment to have them removed. Literally the night before, he caught an article online about Katie's arrest. Just gave a brief mention of the person having an affiliation, a woman that was being arrested having an affiliation with the Dr. Adelson. Okay, well that's strange. Adelson doesn't seem like a common name, and that just happens to be my name of my dentist, a doctor in, in South Florida. So that caused me to, to Google uh, more information about the case. He told his wife Pat what he'd found online, and she was just as shocked. Still, Richard really needed his wisdom teeth out. I do understand that there's a difference between looking guilty and being guilty. But that said, the evidence doesn't look very good, you know, circumstantially, for Charlie at least. In the end, he didn't get his teeth pulled that day. He canceled his appointment. But his wisdom teeth are still there, and it can be hard to find a good dentist. I guess here we come to another irony to it all. Um, when you had called me regarding this podcast, literally the same day I got a call from Adelson's office, and I had been back subsequently out to get my teeth cleaned and, you know, regular cleanings. This last time that I went in uh, last week, uh, it was highly suggested that I really needed to get my wisdom teeth out. And I'll probably let him do it. As far as I'm aware, they're still good dentists. You know, obviously, if something happens and that changes, then I will cancel that appointment. But I just think it's, as Americans, it, it is part of that slippery slope in which we all live, you know, which we can all say that any part of our, our funds are used for nefarious purposes. You know, our tax dollars are used for wars in other countries that hurt other people. I mean, yeah, Richard has some theories. I don't know how Charlie met the particular woman but if you go into a restaurant or nightclub in Miami, it's not many degrees of separation from finding someone who can, if not directly connected, could connect you to someone who is willing to do anything for a couple of dollars. But will prosecutors ever have enough evidence to arrest the maestro? You know, I asked her point blank, you know, who, uh, what do you think happened? And her response was, well, Danny had no shortage of enemies. And that's one of two conversations we've had since uh, uh, Danny was killed. Well, I can recall a good many cases that went forward to trial with less evidence. Tell us what Danny would have, what you think Danny would have wanted. Danny's Danny is turning over in his grave, grave yeah. right now. That's on the next and final episode of this season of Over My Dead Body. <laughs> From Wondery, this is part five of six of Over My Dead Body, a story about love, justice, and money. Over My Dead Body was written and reported by me, Matthew Scher, and Eric Benson. Additional reporting by Sam Turkin. Sound design by Jeff Schmidt. Associate producer is Chris Siegel. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. <laughs>